This is Coons Ford Turf Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turp Talk. Good evening, sports fans and Turp fans. This is Wayne Viner along with intern Mason. Bill is behind the glass. Bruce is away from the microphone today. And you know, Mason, tomorrow it's opening day. And to me, that's always uh, a holiday. After my generation, you either took your radio to school, you ran home to watch it on TV. You still think opening day is that big a deal? I really just can't say that. I mean, we haven't been that big baseball people, mainly, I think, because there really hasn't been a great baseball team around here recently. Great. Eh, you, you're probably right. Well, back, in, back in your day when they were winning the World Series, it must have been a huge deal. But, you know, when I was younger, they were almost irrelevant. Wow. They, they were. They, that, that's, there's, a, there's a statement. There's a snapping terp statement for you. Uh, you. You had some other things to talk about, but before we get to that, later today, we'll have Todd, who's at the Maryland-Georgetown women's game. We're going to have Dennis Kulatsis talking about the Ravens NFL draft. Maryland's Pro Day was earlier today. Over 30 teams came out to watch the Terps who are eligible for the NFL draft. What do you have on the basketball side? Well, tonight's the night that could have been with the McDonald's All-American game. You see five players that Mark Turgeon was considered a front runner at one point or really in the deal. Moses Brown, Emmanuel Quickly, Devin Dotson, Keldon Johnson, and Cameron Reddish will all be out there tonight. And one turp, one made it, Jalen Smith. But, you know, for Maryland basketball, it's all about the grad transfers now. Oh, that's Mason. Come on, man. We got what's that? One out of six? Yeah, one out of six. That's probably not too good, but the one's pretty good. Jalen Smith is looking pretty good out there. Um, is he playing with these guys or against them? Or are you clear on that? Uh, he's playing with Moses Brown and Emmanuel quickly and playing against Dotson, Johnson, and Reddish. All right. Out of that gang, which is the one that we had to have past sticks? It's really up for debate. I mean, any of them could have been used, but I think it's Emmanuel quickly because he's a point guard and something that we still don't have is a backup point guard. And because he's sort of local. He went to school. Where'd he go? He went. I don't I don't remember, but I think is he's from Bel Air. Yeah, Bel Air. Yeah. So you, you could drive there from here. I mean, that's close enough. Those are the kind of guys we got to get if we really want to step up. But grad transfers getting to be a dirty word to me because they haven't really worked out for us. The, the closest, I guess, Suleiman? Yeah, if you go back to 2014, we've had Rashard Pack, who gave them great minutes for the one season. Then you had Rashid Suleiman, who's the best out of the group. And these last two years have kind of not given you much at all with LG Gill and Sean Obi. You can't leave out Logan Ehrenholt. He, he's down the list. Well, Other he, transfers that we've gotten, Robert Carter... Evan Smotrich, and Des Wells. Well, those are actual transfers. Yeah. All right, so for this year, since we still need a point guard, and we probably need a center, and we'll get to our NBA draft possibilities for the Terps in a moment, who's still out there as a center that Maryland can bring in? Well, as of now, almost every guy is out there, but the main center that's being talked about for the Terps is Tark Owens from Upper Marlboro, Maryland. He went to Tennessee for a year, then St. John's for two He's a, he's a rougher guy. He plays down and dirty down low, something that Maryland has lacked these past few years. Led St. John's in blocks with three a game. And he's actually been a guy that we've seen improve year over year. He started off only averaging a point a game. He got up to eight this past year. And he's increased his rebounds from one a game to five. Is that just a factor of minutes, or do you think he's actually better? Well, it's a factor of both. He's, his minutes have increased since his freshman year from seven to 30 being a starter last year. It's kind of rough to see, you know, a guy that's transferred already once in his career. You, you got to look at what you got. And around here, this is a guy that wants to go to Maryland. And I think that's why they should get him, because he's a guy that really wants to be here and he really wants to play for Maryland. It's either Maryland or St. John's for him. So if you're Mark Turgeon, you know, you don't want to let this opportunity slip away because what we've seen with these, some of these recruits is, there are guys that want to go to Maryland, and there are guys that's a toss-up for it. you got to get the guys that want to go to Maryland first. That's how you establish a program that does great things. Well, the, the other thing you have to do is make sure these guys don't get off campus before you actually get a commitment. And it seems like these guys say they want to go to Maryland. They come, they look around, they leave, they 
take a day trip to Kansas and they're gone like a guy named DeSouza. Yeah, well, you know, he's playing in the Final Four right now, so can't really blame him for that. No, but Bruno, when I talked to Bruno after they lost, it's the last time I saw the guys, when they lost to Wisconsin in Madison Square Garden, it's about, is that three weeks ago tomorrow? I, wow. That's yeah. A, boy, I mean, it's it been, it's been a while. while. He was talking about how often he talked to DeSouza. They still talked every day. They went to school together at... Uh, IMG down in Florida. Yep. So he was supposed to be a Terp. He didn't play a lot for Kansas this year, DeSouza. But he, he certainly got in the game, which I thought was... There have been so many great games in this NCAA tournament. But that game against Duke and Kansas... Boy, that one had me up off the couch. That was actually fun for me because I seemed to dislike one of those teams. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just, just a little bit, you know. <laughs> and to see Duke lose and to see Grayson Allen shoot and have the ball roll off the rim instead of roll in because my whole life for Duke, that ball rolls in at the end and they win and they're throwing roses. It's the greatest thing that ever happened. It's like New Year's Eve and, uh, and VJ Day all over, people kissing sailors in the middle of the street, the whole thing. And this time it didn't go their way. And now Kansas flies into the Final Four. Would you say that you, who, who do you think is the favorite out of the four teams in the Final Four? I got to say, even though I've picked Michigan, the way that they're playing right now, Villanova is the team to beat. Man, can they play offense. Like, man, do they just have big guys that can shoot. And they always seem to pull these guys off that a team like Maryland or Syracuse just says, eh, we don't really want you. And Jay Wright just goes and he scoops them up and then. Three years later, they're seniors, and they're in the Final Four. Like a Phil Booth? Like Phil Booth, like Jalen Brunson. I mean, he finds these guys that fit his style and that execute his plays a way that it seems like no one else can, and then slowly they develop over time. They don't really play much as freshmen, but by the time they're seniors, they're national stars. All right, so Michigan. Michigan's somebody that you had high on the board. Uh, Bruce and I saw him in New York City. We saw him against Maryland, and Michigan was fantastic against Maryland late in the season. How did they do it? It's coaching. It's all coaching for them because you look at the guy that made that shot against Houston, Jordan Poole, not a big recruit, developed over time over one year. He's only been there for one year. Developed over time, became a big-time factor for them coming off the bench, and then you have a guy like Mo Wagner, who was a more highly touted international player. And just slowly over time, it seems like every year the, now, they just get better and better, and then they have a game like they did against Maryland, and then they're able to repeat that in the tournament against Texas A&M, and suddenly they're in the Final Four. It's well, been, they also won the Big Ten. Yeah, two years in a row now, and I think it's coming up on three out of six or four out of six years now that they've made at least the Elite Eight. That's not bad. I guess Harbaugh would like to be there, but it's actually Beeline who seems to be the better coach at Michigan. And that leaves the national story, which is a storybook for Loyola of Chicago. I had him winning a couple games, but I certainly didn't have him going to the Final Four. What are they, 32-5? and five? They got to be. I think they came in 30-5. and five. So what does that make them right now? 33-5? and five, 34? Okay. All right, we'll take it. Uh, boy, they, they actually play well together. They play very together, and it's a team that has one big man. Something that a team like, I don't know, Maryland could look at and say, they got one big man that's a freshman, and the rest of them, it's guard after guard after guard, and they're just going to throw it at you. They're going to get out and run. And their coach is one of my favorite guys in this tournament because he looks like he's playing the game while coaching. He, he does. That's come up when we watch them. They are, they are so into it. They are the, the, I guess the uh, queen of the ball they have the glass slipper, uh, but you have a penchant for picking the winners. You lead the second chance bracket challenge, the Trip Talk Bracket Challenge, presented by Nonprofit Services. Uh, Mason's first, a couple people in second, but they're not even close. I, I think I'm in 20 something place. Bruce is about 15, but Mason, you're number one. You've done it year over year. W what's your secret to getting these bracket challenges right? You know, for me, the first round's always the rough one, and as time goes on, my teams somehow just seem to win. This one's starting in the Sweet 16, and I really just looked at what I had left from my original bracket, which wasn't much, and what I thought was going to happen, and even though I had a team like Kentucky going to the Final Four, 
I got Michigan right, I got Kansas right, and I got Villanova right, and it's just what you've seen in the tournament is what you can only look at because it's a new season. That's how a team like Loyola Chicago gets to this point. You've got to throw everything you've done out and then just focus on what's right in front of you. And? And then hopefully you win a game. You know, look, look at a team like Loyola <laughs> Chicago. They've won two games, the first two, against Miami and Tennessee at the last second. And look at where they are now. They just play as a team and they keep pushing forward. They Absolutely they do. You are listening to Coons Ford Turp Talk here on 1300 CBS Sports Radio. Uh, of course, we have this Wednesday show. Saturday, we are off. There is no sports maven this Saturday. We will be back next Wednesday for Turp Talk at 6 o'clock. You've been covering some other games. You've been out with the In the Crease Lacrosse uh, website looking at some other teams. So you've gotten a little bit of exposure there. We've got football. You went to the football practices. You get, you're getting to go to all these sports at the same time. Which one's your favorite? Oh, it has to be football. You know, we call ourselves a football family around here. And it's just great to see the guys back out there. And right now, it's looking good. They, it looks like they got some receivers, an actual group of receivers, instead of let's throw the ball to DJ Moore every play. Richard Lewis just looks great. He has. He does. I, the new offensive coordinator, which is Matt Canada, is somebody that you have liked for a while. Um, do, do you think it's going to take a while for these Maryland football tickets to be worth anything? I mean, what what point does this turn a little bit in our favor? And I'm not talking about seven and six or six and seven, and you'll lose the last bowl game out there. Certainly not talking about a three win season. What's your estimate of what it's going to take to to be an, a perennial eight win team? Well, on your first question about how to get the tickets worth money and how to get fans in the stadium. It seems to be one answer around here, and that's just simple. you got to win the games. It's the only way to get fans to go around here, even with something as big as Maryland basketball, the Ravens, the Redskins. When, they, when they're not that great, you get the real fans out there, which seems to be 12,000, 13,000 for Maryland basketball and fifty-five for the NFL teams around here. It's really rough to get fans to come out. There's so much to do around here, and it just seems like going to the games is kind of almost devalued. It is. I think we're going to get back to this because there's one other, there's a similar topic. So we'll talk Maryland football in the third segment when we get Todd back on. He's out in College Park. Two things happen TV-wise that are going to impact whether you're a Maryland fan, a, a, even a Duke fan, God forbid, any of these. Well, one is, as the world gets to be more television and pay cable oriented, the Orioles don't have any games on local television, over the air television this year. So that's thing one. And thing two, as you told me, the ESPN has finally decided that maybe Sports Center is a little bit over and they're going to pull the morning Sports Center. Now, I used to watch the Maryland games when they were on, on what was, uh, what did they call that? The, the pilot regional network. They had their Billy Packer and, and Dan Bonner and this guy and that guy. And they always had Jefferson Pilot Productions. They used to have the games on local TV. And then you always had the Orioles uh, on WJZ, and they moved over. They've been on two. They've been on 13. And it's just part of living in a big city with, with teams that you're going to turn on the television, not necessarily the cable, not your cell phone, but the actual television. And every once in a while, now you'll be able to see a game. And I think Masson said that's enough of that. I actually want to get Bill in on this one, who's been around the area much longer than Mason's been around anywhere. Bill, what's it mean to you that that the games aren't on TV anymore? I think certainly that baseball is hurting themselves. Baseball is hurting baseball by not being on television. The people that are in an area where maybe they don't get a good penetration of cable, what are they supposed to do to see a game? It's fun to listen to a game on the radio. We run it on the fan here, certainly all the Orioles games. But to watch it on television is almost the equivalent of seeing it live. You get to see all the action as it's happening. And I think it's terrible for baseball to do that. All right. Mason, does it matter to you? Different generation, different perspective. I think it does just because it seems to me that's what baseball was, though. The game where you just flip on the TV and there's baseball for about, what, four or five months out of the year. And it just means something to me because, you know, I'll be sitting at home even though it was only on Sundays. 
And you would just flip on the TV, and there it is on CBS, which was taking Masson's feed and yeah. just putting it back. Well, you, right. meant, you mentioned that to get people in the seats, you've got to win, right? You're saying that's the thing that has to happen around here. If the team doesn't win, people don't come and sit in the seats. And that's just another thing that, that's happening in, in baseball with the Orioles almost every year. When they start to lose, the seats empty out, and nobody runs in there to, right. to, to see that live game and cheer them on and try to give them some courage. But it's the whole live the whole live thing, as Mason said, it's been a problem in college. We've talked about it a lot in college sports. Then we start talking about it in the NFL. I, I think when you take the games off of TV in some ways, you reduce the saleability now. It's got to be in front of you to say, who I want to go out there. All right, I don't have any answers to those global problems. ESPN decides to pull Sports Center not because of anything Sports Center did, but because you could just pick up your cell phone and get the highlights. Does that bother you? I mean, you grew up as this guy who watched Sports Center ten times over. It seemed like that's what was always on for you. Yeah, it does. But I didn't like when they changed it to uh, that Sports Center AM format and the SC at six. There was just they tried to turn it into a talk show, which it never was. They took the highlights out of it, and even sometimes where I'll go on my phone and go on their app and try and look at some of the highlights, there seemed to be almost the wrong plays that they put on. Just seemed like the whole selection of what was really on the show was off, but now they replaced it with the talk show from one of the guys from Mike and Mike, Jalen Rose, and there's another person on there that I'm just blanking on, but I don't really see that succeeding. That's almost like what FS1 has on. Well, FS1 might have a better formula. To me, ESPN and Sports Center was like the Museum of Sports, and whoever produced that and put those highlights together were curators of what you got to see. And I think that that role of having somebody have to pick what you're going to see is gone because the highlights pop up 30 seconds after the play is over. Your phone goes ding and there's the highlight. and You can go back and watch any of the highlights that you want. I think what they should be trying to do, and I think they've tried, it just doesn't work, is get more of a PTI segment going. PTI still is the best show they have on ESPN. They don't show many highlights at all unless it's an absolute must for the story and they discuss what's going on at a very high level if there's anything i could aspire to be it's to have a show that that sounds like that where you think the two people who are talking actually know what they're talking about so you can get to the issues and not have to worry they assume you already saw the play they assume you know who they're talking about so you have to you have to play along as the audience it doesn't work if you don't know anything but if you know something pti is really good that's the value Having their opinions, having their insight makes the highlights worth something. But I grew up in the world where all the highlights were on ESPN. If you wanted to see it, you had to go there. They did a great job of that, but that time is gone. Yeah, it is. And I think for a show like PTI to really be there, I mean, look at Will Bond and Kornheiser. They're old. They've seen a lot. Sports has been around their whole life. I don't know why why you're looking at me like that. Because Bill and I fit that. I was said over a hundred and something years of experience there, young man. And they're just great storytellers. They both wrote for the Washington Post. And they really, even though they have their clock, which is three minutes and then slowly ticks down per topic as the show goes on, they seem to just get that whole story in there in those three minutes. And I think that's what makes that show special. And I think that's a place where you, over the rest of your life, certainly can excel. This is Wayne Viner and for Bruce Bosner. That was based the intern. Thanks to Bill for jumping in there. You are listening to Coons Ford Turp Talk. We'll be back after the break with Dennis Kulatsis. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Coons Ford Turp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. Good afternoon, Terps fans. This is Wayne Viner. Bruce is away. Along with me is intern Mason. Behind the glass is Bill. And we're going to bring in the star of the show, the sponsor. It's Dennis Kulatsis. Dennis, welcome in today. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks for having me on. So I was looking at a couple of these draft boards, and Mason's got this. He's all on top of this. DJ Moore's up to the first round. Mason, who do the draft experts have DJ going to? Well, the other day I saw him going to the Redskins, and and Dennis, I got excited. You did? Why? Why the Redskins? <laughs> you must be a Redskins fan. Of course I am. But good for you. When you're young, you have time to change to become a Ravens fan. You know, when you get older, <laughs> more mature, when your brain develops fully, then you can become a Ravens fan. How about that? 
<laughs> well, I say that in jest, of course. But uh, yeah, they can they can certainly use DJ Moore. Uh, in all seriousness, he's a he's a great receiver. And um, if the Redskins happen to pass on him, I'd like to see the, the Ravens pounce on him at sixteen. So uh, Bruce said that he saw somewhere, and I tried to find it. I didn't come up with it yet. That Odell Beckham Jr. and the Ravens might be a match. Do you have anything on that one? Yeah, I don't think so. The Giants went two first-round draft picks for him. Uh, I, I don't think the uh, the juice is worth a squeeze, so to speak. It's way too much money for for a player like uh, Beckham Jr. with off-field issues. He's had the most recent one. Not a good look for him or the team or the NFL. Uh, buyer beware, two first-round picks. Are, that's way too much real estate for a player of his caliber with uh, with the uh, off-field issue that he brings. Uh, plus, the Ravens, they just don't have the money to sign the guy to a long-term deal. They just don't have the cap space. That's the other consideration. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not... So you got to trade the picks, and then you got to find yeah. the money to sign them. I mean, right. it's, a, it's a whole thing if you want them. But somebody's going to say he's worth it, and it's just a matter of time. It looks like the uh, Rams you know. are taking everybody's uh, problem child and hoping to make it work, and they're trying to make this the year. At what point do the Ravens decide, age-wise, Flacco-wise, et cetera, that if you're going to do it, you better do it now? Well, I, I don't know. I think he's, they still owe him $50 million, $50 million dollars for the next two seasons, Wayne. And, I mean, they're pretty much stuck with him and his contract. I can't see them investing in a quarterback this year. Certainly next year they need to, to draft one in the first round. And if they miss the playoffs again, they'll have, a, they'll have a relatively high draft pick. Well, and what I was alluding to is since you still have them, and you're, there was certainly was room for improvement from last year, but do the Ravens really try and, and force a move to jump ahead this year? Or is this a year to try and build it up and, and give it under a little new leadership a year or two and then be back at the top of the heap? Yeah, I, I can't see them uh, getting a quarterback. Uh, I've heard rumors that if there's a quarterback available at 16, such as Baker Mayfield. Mayfield, I don't think he makes it past the Jets. I think that he'd be a good fit in New York uh, with his persona and everything else that he brings. But I think the, the Ravens, it's premature. They'll be a year early to try to get a quarterback. You know, in, in Flacco's defense, I mean, he, he didn't have re- he hasn't had a receiver, receiver since 2012. So they'd be well served to get him you know, a DJ Moore, you know, a big tight end. There's certainly uh, three or four good tight ends can be had in the second or third round. They need, I mean, they had in the, in the Cincinnati game, uh, the last game of the season, I believe they had nine drops in that game alone. That's not Joe Flacco's fault. When, he, when the guy puts the ball in their hand and they don't catch it, that, that doesn't fall back on the quarterback. So to me, before we, we, uh, we give up on Joe Flacco, let's get him some receivers and see what we have. Uh, not to mention the, you know, the offensive coordinators he's had you know, over the years. But you know, since you're stuck with the guy's contract, let's get him some ammunition and see what happens because they can't move him or his contract. No one's going to trade for Joe Flacco at his age and at his salary. Yeah, is Michael Crabtree really the right guy to make Joe Flacco really top guy again, or do they need to just keep on adding talent and hopefully they'll get something out of him? Yeah, Mason, they have to add talent. Michael Crabtree, he's a surly kind of a guy. He's not a locker room uh, guy. He's, he's uh, I, I wasn't thrilled with the move, but the team is desperate for receivers. They let Mike Wallace go to the Eagles for $2.5 million, which I thought was very cheap. Uh, for Mike Wallace. Mike Wallace's stats were better than Michael Crabtree's last year, so I think the Eagles did a good job with him. But uh, then you got John Brown, who has nothing but hamstring and thigh issues. Nice guy, uh, you know, great story, great comeback story from cell anemia, but uh, 50-50, whether he can get on the field, they need to give Joe Flacco a lot more than what they've given him. Certainly a young receiver in the first round will go a long way to helping him, a tight end. But they lost Benjamin Watson, I believe, today. He signed with the uh, uh, New Orleans Saints, a one-year deal. So they need another tight end, a pass catching tight end. And I would venture to say, Mason, they need another receiver yet in the draft in rounds three or four just to make sure they get somebody on the field that can help Joe Flacco. Today I saw something that really surprised me, and it was one of the mock drafts at ESPN that said in the top, first five picks, four quarterbacks are going to go. Yeah. Do you buy that? Yeah, I do. Quarterbacks like, get overdrafted Mason year after year. Uh, you can't win with that one, and you have to take a, sh- a chance. And if you're a GM or head coach, I mean, you're basing your future on a 22-year-old. And if you hit, you have a Hall of Fame career. If not, you'll be doing uh, 
you know, broad, call it broad, broadcast shows on, on ESPN or what have you, but quarterbacks, you've got to have it, whether it's Josh Allen or Sam Darnold. And there, there is no surefire can in this quarterback candidate this year. All these quarterbacks, they, they have a high floor, but they also have a very low ceiling, uh, Mason. So, but you've got to have it. I wouldn't be surprised if five or six quarterbacks went in the first round. And four to first five picks, certainly, I can see that happening, which is great news for teams like the Redskins and the Ravens, as you know, because great players will, will drop down. And look, for me, it doesn't have to be a wide receiver for the Ravens or the Redskins. So, you know, Roquan Smith, he's there, the linebacker out of Georgia. Uh, Derwin James, a free safety out of Florida State. If a great player drops to, to those numbers in the middle of the first round, you've got to pounce on them. You've got to take the best player available. Uh, never mind drafting uh, for need at that point. I've seen a lot written very recently that the NFL is going to institute new rules where if you hit somebody with your helmet, basically lowering your head to make a play, offense or defense, intentional or not, and whether you hit somebody else in the head or not, that's going to be a penalty. Is it football anymore? Yeah, Wayne, you bring up a great point. It's very subjective, and I don't know at what point uh, what you call it. I understand they're trying to protect the players. It's player safety at a premium. But it's a very fast game. We, we as fans, we see things in slow motion and we react, but these things are bang-bang plays, and I don't know how. Even the play that Ryan Shazier got hurt on, I mean, he, he's been criticized, but it, it happened so fast, he didn't intend to, to tackle in the manner that he did. But these players are just so big, fast, and strong that the reaction time is so quick. Things are going to happen, violent collisions, and Wayne, they're, they're trying to speed up the game and make it safer. I don't know how you do that when you make – that's a very subjective call. I, li- I do like the targeting call in college. I think they could, they could, the NFL can take that and use it to benefit because I think when it's, it's obvious when somebody is, is using excessive force, unnecessary roughness, and targets a player as they try to take him out of the game versus making a good team hard tackle. But they're really, they're really uh, playing with fire here and trying to determine uh, you know, about the crown on the helmet and which way they're leaning and, and what the intention of the player is. It's way too much to pull on the referees. The new leagues that are coming out, at least one of them says no kickoffs and no extra <laughs> points. You have to go, yeah. so you're going to get the ball in the 25 or 30. Uh, no kickoffs ever, and there's no extra point. You're going to have to go for two after every touchdown. It sounds a little strange. You get so used to the way that the NFL and college play that seeing anything different becomes a real oddity. Do you think kickoffs are going to be gone the way of the dodo here out of the NFL? Well, as an NFL fan, as an NFL purist, I certainly would, would hope not, Wayne. I'd, I'd like to see the, the kickoffs uh, be there. Uh, at some point, as you mentioned, what are we watching? We still call it football. And uh, they're, they're really, it, it, there's a lot of danger in doing that. Of course, we have the AFL, I believe it's called, or FFL, and then you have the XFL. I, I can hardly keep up anymore. Vince McMahon in 2020 coming out with his brand again, taking a second shot. Uh, look, let's, let's, to me, I would try to simplify the roles versus adding them and making them more complicated, uh, make them easier for the, to interpret and uh, less subjective. And I, I don't know what they're doing with the game. You know, certainly great kickers like Justin Tucker from the Ravens, he would object to taking the, the, the kickoff out of the, out of the game for sure. He's a weapon. And you see Bill Belichick a lot of time. They kick off short because they want the receiving team to return it so they can A, pin them deep, or, or, or B, cause a turnover. So it does take a strategic element out of the game if they were to do that. It also alters the roster because there's a lot of guys yeah. that make the, the game on specials. And if you take yeah. the kickoff out and you leave the punt in, there's going to be some guys that say, look, we'll just yeah. play the defense on the punt return. We don't need any special teams now, so we're going to go um, refigure what you need on that team. I think one of the biggest drawbacks in the NFL right now is that the roster size is too small for the number of games that they yeah. play, especially to play on a Sunday and then a Thursday. And when you say that the college, you know, a college travel team has 70 players on it for the yeah. big Division One schools, 85 on scholarship, and generally dress about 100 for a home game. So if you get somebody yeah. thrown out for targeting out of a college game, well, you got 99 guys left. You get somebody <laughs> thrown out of an NFL game, especially with injuries, they only have one or one and a half middle linebackers, and now the middle linebacker got thrown out of the game because he tripped and hit somebody with his helmet. And he didn't really mean it. And now they don't have a middle linebacker because there's only 46 guys who dress on Sunday. Right. Now, uh, that's yeah. just not enough. No, it's not. The NFL is such a game of attrition, Wayne. You have 16 regular season games, four preseason games, a lot of uh, time and opportunity for players to get hurt. So, yes, they need to expand the rosters, expand the salary cap 
believe it's 172, 177 million. It's up there. So they need to expand the rosters, allow at least allow the players on the roster to dress. I've never understood that you can have 53, but only 46 are active on game day. That makes no sense to me. But uh, I'm a huge uh, Alabama fan. I love uh, Coach Dick Saban. And the college game, to me, it's, it's a lot better in a lot of aspects over the pro game these days. Oh, I have to agree. I absolutely agree with that. The pomp, circumstance, fanfare. You know, when Mason talks colleges and, and where you'd like to go see a game, it, it, you just start with the SEC. Yeah, And, and absolutely. that's where you want to watch football. But you brought up the, the 53 to 46. Then you take out the kicker, the holder, the yeah. punter, and the long snapper, and that leaves you 42 guys to play football with. And it's just yeah. not enough. So I looked at the Coons Ford website. And at the top is a car that's uh, near and dear to my heart. You have a, a BMW up there at a very affordable price, a Jaguar, a, and a, a nicely equipped Ford Explorer, all on sale as gently previously owned vehicles. But the one that really caught my eye is the Ford Explorer, least special, three thirty nine a month. How are those new Explorers going for you? Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful vehicle, weighing seven passenger, very highly rated, great gas mileage, very safe. A five-star crash safety rating on the vehicle. Uh, we sell a lot of those to not only people in Maryland, but also nationwide. It's moving real well. And uh, we get a lot of repeat customers and also friends and neighbors. Uh, once you test drive the vehicle, it drives like a dream. Uh, you know, Ford is on a great, great from top to bottom with the entire product line. Mason, one of Mason's favorites. We've seen it in the ad. We've seen it on the road a little bit. It's the Expedition. What do you make of what they've done with that? Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful vehicle. It's all aluminum. The entire body weighing in Mason is made of aluminum. Uh, it, it is just a fantastic vehicle. It's got all the latest and greatest gadgets. Why? Built-in Wi-Fi, too, so you can, you can you have a hotspot built into the vehicle. It's made for travel, and it's, uh, it's priced about $30,000 less than the, the sister of the uh, vehicle, the Lincoln Navigator. And we equipped ours with uh, you know leather and the dual moonroof and all the all the all the gizmos, and it's, it's, it's one of my favorite vehicles. They've really done a nice job, and probably the hottest-selling vehicle that we have right now. We can't keep them in stock more than three or four days. One of my new favorites and one of the biggest bang for your buck deals out there, the Mustang GT model. I love it. We just saw it featured on Motor Week, and it was, they loved it, and I've seen one in person, and I loved it. Well, Mason, how old are you these days? How old are you now? Uh, 16 and... Eight months? Nine? Okay, well, well, you have to come out to, to a lot, and I'll take you out. You, we'll take one out for a test drive. We'll, take, we'll, like, we'll get a convertible on a nice day. We'll drop the top down and put that in the back. We'll just we'll take a spin. Just leave me where the coffee is. You guys can go have a good time. <laughs> Dennis, thanks for being on, and thanks for getting me in trouble there. We always appreciate that. My pleasure, uh, my Dennis, pleasure Wayne. Uh, you on this week uh, up the dial? Uh, I'm on this week up the dial. Yep, anybody can just check out our show. They can Google, Google my name, Dennis Palazzos, or give me a call, 410-218-0337. Be more than happy to be a service to them. All right, Dennis, thanks to you, and thanks to Coon Ford for sponsoring Trip Talk and the Sports, Ma- and Sports Maven and the entire Red Turtle Productions nation. This is Wayne Viner. That's intern Mason. Bill is behind the glass. Bruce is away from the microphone today. We'll be back with Todd Carton live from the Maryland women's lacrosse field as they take on Georgetown after this break. We'll see you in a moment. Across from Camden Yards, sponsored by Budweiser. This is Coons Ford Turf Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. Turf fans, it's Wayne Viner, Mason the intern. Bill is behind the glass as he turns the music down and somewhere in College Park is non-rev todd talking women's lacrosse todd how you doing uh you are listening live yes i am for it's uh we're, we're standing here is about eight minutes to go in the first half uh terps leading georgetown for those not watching the game on espn2 uh terps leading 8-2 after the game was tied at um two all maryland has run off six straight goals They've won all but one draw control, and right now, pretty thorough domination. Uh, it's good. If you're dominating and you're number three team in the country, you only have, what, there's two in front of Maryland. Maryland has uh, had this huge run over the unbeatens. Uh, played two unbeatens yep. last two weeks. How'd that turn out, Todd? Uh, 
Well, they're, they're, well, as you said, they play two unbeatens, and there are two unbeatens left, but they're not the two that Maryland played. Uh, Maryland went out up to 10 and uh, took down the Quakers and then had James Madison, who was actually ranked third in the country when the game started here at Maryland, come in, and the Terps took care of them and knocked them from the ranks of the unbeaten. Um, and, and now it's just uh, Stony Brook and Boston College are the last two unbeaten in women's lacrosse. Boston College had a heck of a run. We saw them in the Final Four as a, sort of a home game for them up there at Gillette Stadium, and Maryland took care of them before. Uh, how much better is Boston College now than they were last year when we saw them? Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, Wayne, because last year when we, we Maryland played them up here uh, and beat them in the regular season, but then they got Kenzie Kent in, who had played for their ice hockey team, who was just a special, special player, and she's decided to redshirt this year and play a full season of lacrosse next year. And yet Boston College, who's coached by a former Terp, by the way, um, is, is just rolling through their schedule. They have a great player named Sam Acuso, who's uh, just a dynamic offensive player. And they're, they're obviously for real. They, they're taking care of business. Todd, there was a record crowd at the field hockey lacrosse complex over the weekend. Is it a, it's a great place to be, I hear, when it's sold out. Yeah, I, it was it was kind of rocking here, Mason, and I, and I'm not sure why there was such a big crowd. It was uh, Juvenile Diabetes Day, which is the big cause for Kathy Reese since her son was diagnosed with that with type one diabetes, and it's a relatively local team and a, obviously a top five matchup. But yeah, people just lined up three or four thick along the fences, no place to sit. Uh, 2,600 plus people here. It's a few thousand less tonight. It's a little chilly and been been misting all night. Well, we appreciate your dedication to the non-rev sports. That's how you get the nickname non-rev Todd. My favorite on the non-rev side is the men's lacrosse team. They went out to California, played North Carolina, not an empty seat in the house. Mason, how'd that go? Sellout crowd of 6,970 people watched the Terps take down Depending on which site you look at, number 20th ranked North Carolina, 11-7. to They jumped out to an early lead, and slowly Carolina came back, but the Terps still shut the door on them. A shockey at the faceoff has been dominant. They had Maryland got their first long pole goal of the season, which means a defenseman took the ball, ran over the midfield stripe, and scored. So things happening good for the Terps. I thought that was a key moment in that game. There was a lot of momentum shifted toward Carolina when Bryce Young put that that goal home. I thought Maryland's sideline exploded, got a lot of energy, and and it sort of sealed the deal for that game. So, you know, and 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 I think Bruce, as as Bruce has remarked, you know, to look at Maryland's schedule preseason to see them sitting at seven and one going into the. Big Ten season with the one loss or just a single goal to Albany, uh, I think everybody would be uh, would be happy with that. We're fairly pleased with this one. And that Albany game, that was a good game. Now, next week, Albany comes to UMBC. Uh, Mason and I, along with Bruce, went to UMBC last week and uh, saw Michigan come in. They take down the Retrievers 9-6. to Kevin Connery, who was the defensive coordinator for Maryland men lacrosse last year, now the head coach at Michigan. Maryland travels to Ann Arbor this weekend and takes on the Wolverines. Look, Michigan's teams, actually looking the, the, pretty good. The men and the women. Both get, well, the, the, the men's team, Michigan men's team, has, has vaulted into the top 15 now, uh, which we, we all expected Kevin Connery would do a great job up there. I'm not sure anyone thought it would happen quite this quickly and we'll see when the, how, how they challenge the Terps and of course the, the women also play at Michigan you uh, can, this, this weekend. You can read Todd's uh, writings and musings on the National Lacrosse scene on In the Crease Lax, that's in the com, the sister site to the terptalk.com website. Mason. Todd, when I looked at Michigan over the past few years, there seems to be a lot of talent. Why is there so much? Why are so many people surprised that they're that good this year with the great coach? And it seemed like they had talent till they kind of derailed last year. Well, it's a team that that 
you know, it's sometimes it's, it's just a matter of, uh, I think, a coach coming in and instill, installing a system and instilling confidence. And, and uh, I think that people don't believe in a team until they start winning. And, and Michigan lost a lot of games last year that, that they were in. But, um, you know, now they're, 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 they've started to win. So that's uh, kind of exciting. And, you know, I talked about sort of the power shift in the, in the story I wrote for Inside the Creeps uh, about the, the latest change in the rankings. If you look at the preseason ranking and look now, there, there are eight teams that were unranked at the beginning of the season that are now in the IL's top 20. That's pretty good. You know, if it wasn't for sports, the words instilling and ensuing would probably be stricken from the Webster's Dictionary. So we thank <laughs> the sports gods for those two words. Well, and home and home would probably be gone as well. So yeah, that, that would be a, a, a total anachronism. <laughs> it would, or some other kind of spider. I'm not sure. Todd, <laughs> thanks for checking in. Uh, we will see you back on this on these airwaves next Wednesday, talking women's and uh, men's lacrosse. All right, and the score just moved to eight three as Georgetown broke Maryland's six goal run. And I look forward to talking to you again soon, Wayne. All righty, bye bye. Bye bye. Mason, you were talking about the guys that Maryland sort of missed on in basketball and that there's the All-American game tonight. I remember when the All-American game, the McDonald's All-American game was at the U.S. Air Arena. And then it was at uh, Verizon Center. In fact, I know Travis Garrison, who played for Maryland, he was a DeMatha All-American. He was watching uh, the videotape showing his kids that he was a McDonald's All-American back in the day. What were you talking about uh, with some of these guys and where they fit in with the Maryland system, or, or they don't? You know, when you look at what was done with these five guys that we talked about earlier in the show. And those five guys are, quickly. Moses Brown, Emmanuel Quickly, Devin Dotson, Keldon Johnson, and Cameron Reddish. Mm-hmm. Then there's this four-star guy who ended up committing to Boston College this year named Jarius Hamilton, who's a top 200, 300 guy mm-hmm. who was it seemed like he was more after Maryland than Maryland was after him. We're talking about top talent here. Four-star guy, small forward. And it just seemed like Maryland never called him back to go and finally offer him. And you well, know, It seems like, but then if you look at one position that Maryland has some talent, depending on how you layer this, between Morsell and Herter, and who's the, uh, the new guy, Keith Gatlin's project? Aaron Wiggins. Aaron Wiggins. I mean, you've got small forwards. Now, I know you need basketball players. Now, there's a kid, Sorrell Smith who decommitted from Ole Miss, who's a three-star, four-star talent. He's a point guard. I don't know where Maryland stands with him, but some of these plays, if I still think of Maryland's because I'm a Terp as a premier place, and then you read every play, they're, they're not even in the conversation really anymore, and that that hurts me. And when, you, when the topic of the show is, when we open and close with a topic, that here are the guys Maryland tried to recruit, and then they didn't come here. It's just not a happy place to be. Yeah, and I think when you're talking about this grad transfers with a guy like Tarek Owens, who wants to be here, it seems like Trojan's still going to go after a kid like Ryan Taylor, who's a guard from Evansville, that apparently the day after he said that he's transferring, he averaged 21 points a game this season. He had 21 teams, Power 5 teams in basketball call him up. Well, it's not that Maryland's out of scholarships. I mean, no, you could take both not, of these guys. It's not that there's something wrong with the fact that they go and chase out a top talent. That's what we want here, and we got one guy out of six. But you also have to say to the guys that really want to be here that we still got you, you know. You'll play. You'll if play. If you come here, we, well, obviously we were, sort of ran out of kids last year. I don't know how obvious that was. But Very. In, in Turgeon's retelling and the sort of – Look at what happened to poor Maryland. We ran out of humans. We didn't have anybody left to play basketball. And in the end, in summation, the only person's job it is to make sure that you have the players and you coach the team, I guess, is the, the coach's job. And that's where you were pointing with this. Yeah, well, we watched Kansas this weekend. And, you know, Silva de Sosa had to come out there and play because their one other center was hurt. It's not like it only happens here. It's just at three positions it only happens here. All right. Well, what happened to football happened to basketball. Too many people got hurt, and the depth wasn't there. I'd like to thank Dennis Galatzis from Coons Ford, Bill for running the show behind the glass here, Mason, thanks a lot, Todd Carton and and the whole gang. Uh, Like I said, we are off on Saturday, and, of course, our big news for those going out to Camden Yards, stop by 
and get a corned beef sandwich from... Atman's Deli, which is right behind home plate. In Camden Yards. Check them out tomorrow if you're going out to the game. Thanks for listening. This has been Wayne Viner. Bruce is away from the mic. We will see you next Wednesday here on 1300 CBS Sports Radio.